Shalom and welcome to our program, Messiah in the Torah. Now we have come to a Torah portion in the book of Deuteronomy called Ki Tavo, which means when you come in. And it begins to deal with the subject of first fruits. So I will begin to read from Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 1. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. This principle of the first fruits, the first of the harvest, is something that occurs uh, frequently throughout Scripture, and especially in the uh, um, apostolic writings, the so-called New Testament. And I want us to go to uh, the book of Romans and read from chapter 11 the way that Rabbi pa uh, Paul, Rav Shaul, uh, is explaining this uh, mystery of first fruits. And... Um, it says, let us read from verse 12 here. It's talking about the Jewish people. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, this was when they um, handed Messiah over to the Romans to crucify him. And that, of course, meant that the world was reconciled with God. And if their failure or if they're diminishing, as it is expressed in the King James Version, uh, means riches for the Gentiles. This diminishing is referring to the first who accepted the gospel among the Jewish people when it was preached on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. 3,000 were saved in that day. So it was um, a, a small beginning harvest from the uh, Jewish people coming to faith in Messiah. Uh, and this means riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their full inclusion mean? Let's go down to verse 15. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Uh, and then it says in verse 16, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So this is an explanation why Paul is able to reason and say if their, um, uh, if their failure here or their rejection means reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Because the first fruits, when it is given to God, it means that the entire lump, the entire harvest will then be holy to God. That's a principle we find in Scripture. And um, because Abraham, Isaac and Jacob being the fathers of the nation of Israel, because of their obedience to God, their faith in God, uh, it made the, uh, their uh, answer, uh, their descendants, I should say, uh, coming after them, being also set apart in a special way for God. 
If the root is holy, so is the entire tree. If the first fruits is holy, so is the entire lump or the entire harvest. In Hebrew, this word um, translated as first fruits is bikurim. And uh, it is related to a word that can also be translated as uh, a test. And giving the first to God is really a test uh, of our loyalty, of our faith, and of our love towards God. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So that's why the people of Israel were commanded in the Torah here uh, to take the first of the harvest from the land and present it before God as a sacrifice. And that would mean then that the entire harvest would be uh, holy and blessed by God with abundance. Uh, how much would they was required for them to give as first fruits? Because this is not included in the tithe. The tithe is separate. This is a um, sacrifice or an offering above the tithe. Uh, the rabbis concluded that approximately 2% is what is uh, needed in order to bring a first fruits sacrifice. Uh, if you were generous, you would give a 40th of the harvest. Uh, if you were not so generous, a 60th would also be acceptable. So the average was a 50th, which means 2%. And this was something that was only required of the specific species um, connected and associated with the promised land. Let's read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we're going to read uh, from verses uh, 7 and 8. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. Now, it has to be remembered that honey here is not referring to bee honey in this case, but to the date honey. So uh, honey here is uh, actually referring then to the palm tree, the date palm tree. In the biblical days, this was the primary source of uh, sweetening uh, in the cooking. It was the uh, uh, date honey. So the uh, bikurim, the first fruit sacrifice, was only required on these seven specific species to the promised land. And what the farmer did when he saw uh, the first fruit from, for example, a fig tree, he took a ribbon, tied it uh, around that branch, and he declared, this is Bikurim, it is first fruits. And then in biblical times, and specifically the Second Temple period, what they did in a village was to gather all the first fruits sacrifices and load it on a cart um, that was pulled by an oxen. And this oxen was then decorated with a wreath and a crown of silver. And the people representing the village would take all the bikurim to the temple and present it to the priest there. And it was done with great joy, with dancing, with music. They were um, doing this with so much celebration because God loves a cheerful giver. That's what Paul is stating in 2 Corinthians. And it's taken from the sacrifices in the temple, because they are always connected with rejoicing before God. And bringing the first fruits was a statement to God that um, God had been merciful by fulfilling his promise, being faithful to his promise. And the blessing was then uh, recognized as coming from the hand of God. Let's note this here. If we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 26, the spe specific prayer that was to be prayed at this time. 
um, from verse 5 in Deuteronomy 26. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. And there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds and terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. So this first fruit sacrifice was then a declaration before God that he had been faithful to his promise. And it was uh, also a proclamation of God's grace, mercy and goodness. The people from the beginning, they were nothing. They were wanderings. Uh, 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 the forefather was a wandering Aramean, referring to Abraham living in the land of Ur, uh, in the land of Chaldeans. And then the people were brought into Egypt and there they became enslaved. They, they could not get free. But God was merciful when the people cried out to him and he set them free, brought them into this abundant land flowing with milk and honey. So that means because it was God who had done this in answer to prayer, the first belongs to him. Now, Messiah is called first fruits uh, by Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He is the first fruits from the dead, the first from the new harvest of the resurrection. And because he is the first fruit, so all who are in him and believe in him, trust in him, will also receive resurrected bodies one day because he's the first fruits guaranteeing the entire harvest of those who will be raised from the dead. Uh, another Hebrew word that is used also about the first fruits is reshit, which means first. And that is uh, found as the first word actually in the entire Bible. And it's a title also of the Messiah. And it is occurring also in the last chapter of the Bible. Um, this is something that was now when it comes to the first fruits sacrifice, the Bikurim that was brought before the Lord, it was something that began to be taken to uh, Jerusalem, to the temple on the feast of Shavuot. And then they could continue to bring their first fruit sacrifices throughout the year up till Sukkot, even up to Hanukkah. It was accepted to bring the first fruit sacrifice and rejoice before God. And it's significant that it was, it began to be brought before the Lord on the feast of Shavuot. That's when the first fruits harvest was brought in from the Jewish people as 3,000 uh, believed the gospel on that day. And it's a sign of that one day uh, the entire harvest will come in and be a blessing to the world. Now, Paul is also referring to believers as first fruits at least twice. We read, I'm going to use the New King James Version here in Romans 16 and 5. Greet my beloved Epanetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Messiah. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanas, that is, it, that it is the first fruits of Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So obviously both Epanetus and also the family of Stephanas, they were uh, among the first believers in Achaia. So they are called first fruits. Uh, so we need to um, 
honor God with our first fruits, and then we know that the rest of the harvest will be uh, holy and it will be blessed. It says in verse 15 here uh, that the priest would pray this prayer uh, when they brought the first fruits. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the ground that you have given us as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. And when we give the first fruits of our income uh, to God, it is something that will bless our um, economy in a special way. We have the promise in the scriptures about that. Let's continue now to chapter 27, and we are going to see what it says here uh, about the renewal of the covenant when the people come into the land of promise. Let's read uh, from verse 2. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this Torah, this law, when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. Can stop there for a moment. So, in other words, the very first thing that they were commanded to do when they crossed over the Jordan was to write a copy of the Torah on stones, and uh, they were to um, have large stones and plaster them and then write the entire Torah on those rocks, those stones. It's important to remember that. We'll continue to read in verse 4. And when you have crossed over Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Eval, and your you shall plaster them with plaster, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. Uh, by the way, uncut stones are also referred to in Scripture as living stones. They have not been cut with an iron tool. They are living stones, and that's what we are called, who are a new creation, in Messiah, we have become living stones, making up this temple of God. Um, of uncut stones, and continue in verse 6, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings, and you shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. Here you have it again, always rejoicing is connected with worship. And you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. Let's continue now to verse 9. Then Moses and the Levitical priests said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. Here are three things mentioned now. First of all, of course, it is the people of Israel that are referred to here in this passage. Secondly, it talks about the land of Israel, when you enter into the land. And thirdly, it is talking about the law, the Torah. That was to be, um, actually, these three things, they constitute what I call a holy trinity that can never and must never, I should say, be separated from one another. The people of Israel is holy. It is God's chosen people, and they are so forever. Jeremiah make that very clear, that as long as uh, sun and moon and the stars shine, the people of Israel will never cease to be a holy people before God. And in the same way, the land of Israel is holy to God. It's called, therefore, the Holy Land, and uh, it will remain to be so forever. It is the promised land to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. 
And thirdly, we know that the Torah is also something that will never pass away as long as heaven and earth stand. That's what Yeshua said in the Sermon on the Mount. So they, these are uh, three holy things that are eternal that go, and they go together. Why am I emphasizing this? Because there are some people today um, who can accept one or two of these things, but not all three. And that's an error. For instance, some uh, Christians today have begun to discover the Torah, the blessing of the um, teaching uh, uh, of the Lord in, in, in all the commandments. They have been um, rejected by most of Christendom for thousands of years, but now God is beginning to restore the Torah again to Christians, not only to the Jewish people. And so they are excited about the Torah. And some of them are even excited about the promised land. They love Israel, but they are uh, rejecting the authority of the Jewish people. And they say, well, we have the Holy Spirit. The Jewish people, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't uh, know what the Torah is really all about. We are the ones who have the authority to understand the Torah wherever we live, Australia or the United States or Scandinavia. Uh, bless God, the Torah is for us and we know how to interpret it. This is something that is uh, not um, a blessing in God's eyes. It is repeating the mistake that the church eventually made when they rejected the Jewish people and their standing as uh, continually being uh, a chosen people before God. The Catholic Church, for instance, annually used to gather the Jews um, before the Pope in Rome and they would point, the Pope would point to the Torah and he would say, good book, and then turn to the Jewish people and say, bad people. So in other words, the Torah is good, but the Jewish people, we must not listen to them. Of course, Martin Luther wrote his horrible book called On the Jews and Their Lies and rejected all of the Jewish interpretation of scripture and all the Jewish tradition and so forth. And this is something that still, uh, you know, just like Yeshua said uh, about the scribes and the Pharisees, they said, if we had lived on the days of our forefathers, we would not have stoned the prophets. Um, well, today, some people say, if we had lived in the days of Constantine or Martin Luther, we would not have done what they did. And yet they continue basically to write a new chapter in the book on the Jews and their lies, thinking they know more about the Torah than the Jewish people. That is a mistake. Um, God, Paul writes that um, what is the advantage of circumcision? Much in every way, because to them, the Jewish people have been committed the oracles of God. It is important that we can respect uh, the uh, wisdom that God has given to those who were uh, uh, who were uh, given the, from the beginning the Torah to be a custodian uh, 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 and responsible for the Torah. It is very important. Then you have other Christians. They, um, they say, we love Israel. We love the Jewish people. But the Torah has been done away with. We, we don't want anything to do with the law of Moses. That is uh, not in the new covenant. That is also a mistake. And thirdly, you have some Christian, specifically theologians for the most part, they accept the, the calling of the Jewish people. They also um, accept the validity of the Torah, but they refuse to uh, accept the fact that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people and they do not support uh, the right of the Jewish people to their own land. But together, when the Jewish or the people of Israel came into the land and they recognized the authority of the Torah, then the, that trinity is complete of the land, the people and the Torah. And that combination is still there with potential to bless the world with life from the dead when they turn to the Messiah. 
That's the foundation of the blessing for the world. Hallelujah. So when the people here, let's read on in chapter 27, they had set up these stones. Uh, it says in verse 11, that day Moses charged the people saying, when you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. And then it lists uh, seven, six of the tribes, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Eval for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Sevlon, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levite shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice. And then it's listed a, a list here of curses. So the way it was done was that the Levites and the elders of the tribe of Levi, they were to pronounce in the valley between these two mountains, these blessings and these curses. First came the curses. And whenever a curse was pronounced, like it says, cursed is the man who makes a caved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord. Um, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman and sets it up in secret and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Those were the six tribes standing on Mount Eval when they heard that curse by the Levitical priests, they would say, respond by saying, Amen. Then uh, after all the curses had been pronounced, they changed it and said, blessed is the man who does not make a carved or cast metal image and so on. And then the other remaining six tribe would stand on the Mount of Blessing and say, Amen. And before God, that would be like these six tribes on Mount Gerizim, Mount Blessing. It was like they had pronounced the blessing, but they never pronounced the blessing. They just said, Amen. In the same way, the people on the Mount Eval, it was like they had pronounced the curses, but they never did. They just said, Amen. This is the foundation in the Bible for the use of the internationally known word, Amen. It, when you say, Amen, it means that you are confirming what you just heard. And in, before God, it is just as if you had voiced those words. Uh, the person who pronounced the words never said Amen. It was those who heard the words. When they said Amen, it was before God like they had pronounced the same words. So Hallelujah and Amen are two uh, internationally known phrases in Hebrew that we are still used today. And that's the background of the meaning of Amen. Hope you learned something today. I don't have time for more this week, but uh, God bless you and Shalom from Jerusalem. Thank you.